you have political tensions around the world, as you do. Mm. You add climate, you add fire, you add drought, you add melting of glaciers. It is a conflict multiplier, an escalation of existing political tension. If you had the possibility to change three things in order to make a difference, what would you do? I would set an end date for when we, take, uh, when we extract coal and gas from the ground. Anything above uh, zero is a disaster. And we've framed it in our minds as we're competing towards a finish line where we can tap ourselves uh, on the shoulders and say we succeeded. We only fucked up uh, to one and a half degrees. And some days I'll go, yeah, we're pioneering the possible. Awesome. And some days you'll go. And the day go. after, I'll go, pioneering the possible. Bullshit. Absolutely bullshit. We're not doing that. <laughs> Welcome back to The Switch, not just another podcast, but an entertaining, educating show to make sure you keep up in the green transition. We want to help you and everybody around you to make the switch in a fast way by inspiring you and making sure that you're up to date with what's going on. And with me in the studio, of course, I have DMB and Jacob and I have Emil. Hello. Hello, guys. Hello. All good? Yeah, all good. All yeah. good. As good as can be. Yeah. As good as can be. I understand that because today we have a very exciting guest, but I'm going to let you linger there a little bit more about before we get going on that. Before we uh, talk and tell you who that is, I want to remind you to subscribe. I want to remind you that if you want to make the biggest impact, make sure to share this episode, to share it to a friend, a neighbor or someone else who can get inspired on the way. I hope you do that already now. And last but not least, I want to remind you of my buttons I have with me here today to make sure that we talk real stuff. First, of course, we have the bullshit button. Bullshit. Wow. That's when I don't understand or when my guests don't understand or when we think that something really needs to change and it's bullshit. And sometimes we also need to elevate and make sure that everybody understands how great this is. And that's when we use the awesome button awesome. and you see it's just amazing it's just awesome right without further ado it's time to introduce today's guest today's guest describes herself and listen to this tech diplomat economist investor digitalization strategist in green transition political advisor scrap ex scrap dealer and aubergine lover Hmm. She spent her time in the intersection of geopolitics, technology and impact investing. She is the co-founder of the sustainable technology think tank Sustainable, geopolitical advisor at Consilio International and previously an investor at EQT Ventures. In 2011, she co-founded the disruptive global fintech startup RAP with Skype founder Zenström and LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman as an early investor. Born in London, raised partly there as well as in the Saudi and Sweden with previous lives in scrap dealing at Stena Metal, speech writing and attempts at stand-up comedy. Well, <laughs> you see, this is a very interesting person we are going to talk to today. Let me uh, welcome Aror. Bellfrage to The Switch, not Thank just another podcast. Thank you very much for having me. How exciting. I am exciting. I, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Are you sure? I, <laughs> there you go. Awesome. I am excited about what I wanted to say. You are truly an influencer in this industry and you're making a big difference, not only with your voice, but actually re really making a difference last but not least by the book you have next to you which is um klimatet och den nya världsordningen what would that be in english climate change and the new world order mm. we're going to talk more about that and today's episode we're actually going to talk and learn very much about the geopolitical landscape especially in europe so i'm super excited so am i what are you uh hoping for today 
I'm hoping to press the bullshit button a few times, yes. uh, mainly because there is quite a lot of bullshit, uh, especially when you talk about climate and energy. So it's, there's some obvious times that we can press the button, uh, but then hopefully end on some awesome. Okay, uh, it's a good, uh, it's a good strategy. Let's go there. Uh, listen, I wanted to ask you in the beginning here that you once said that you're both a worried citizen and an exci excited investor. What are you worried about as a citizen and what are you excited about as an investor? Well, I think it's important to uh, hold two thoughts in your mind at the same time and, and um, be true to those quite opposite or polar emotions, both scared as well as uh, enthusiastic. And in terms of scared, it's obvious we know why we're here. We've known for the last 40 years what will happen if we continue to burn coal and gas. Um, and not the least, we now know also the oil industry has known it for the last 40 years as well. Mm. Um, and we've done very little, which means it's some sort of five to 12 and we're rushing to somehow save humanity. And given the fact that we're moving in such a slow pace and waiting for the last minute, um, but also, I mean, everyone's paraphrasing, but allow me to paraphrase Greta's blah, blah, blah. Yeah. In that, I, f I sense, um, I, I feel a, a deep sense of worry that we're talking, we're not acting, there's no, maybe not enough fear in the system. And depending on what day you ask me that question, I will be um, different in sense of uh, hope and excitement. And sometimes I feel very dark and, and bleak. Mm. But on the other hand, I am an investor and that's what I do. I find technology very exciting. Um, I wouldn't say that technology uh, is the silver bullet. I don't think technology is going to save us. Um, I'm not a technology optimist in that sense. I think it's a question of reordering priorities, which means first we need to set our planetary uh, boundaries. We need to understand that we violated them. Um, and once we've made peace with that, we can use technology as a tool, a very, very powerful Powerful tool to transition into a fossil free economy. And obviously, as an investor, that is very exciting. Ah, Any type of transition, mm -hmm. huge wealth will be created, um, empires will be built. And being a pioneer in that, taking early bets, understanding technology. And in terms of many transitions, this is probably less risk in the sense that we have to go to the fossil free um, uh, state at some point. So in terms of an investment thesis, it's quite clear. So now it's about making uh, bets. And that is uh, potentially, or we can already see, uh, a profitable um, uh, game, if you want. Mm. But the co contextually, it's a very serious one. To get to know you, what's more, excited or worried? It depends on the day. It depends on the day. Yeah. Sometimes you'll, you'll find me very excited and very hopeful. And we in Sweden, we use the, the tagline, pioneering the possible. And some days I'll go, yeah, we're pioneering the possible. Awesome. And some days you'll go... And the day go, after, I'll go, pioneering the possible. Bullshit. Absolutely bullshit. We're not doing that. We're just talking about it. Mm. And we're picking the lucrative cherries out of the cake, which means that we're ignoring the big bucket of things that we have to do in terms of adaptation that will not be profitable and will be huge cost and and uh, emotional and physical uh, strain mm. so depends on the day wow we really got to know you early on in this show you can feel the passion inside of you and you feel the energy before we dive into like answering the questions of why we what we can do about it can i uh, get to know you a little bit more go for it let's go and roll the wheel of questions I've let's see what this. you got i've heard of this Wheel of Questions If you could choose to do anything in a day, what would it be? I mean, uh, given that I've showed you my my polarity and my sign is uh, Gemini, so it's it's written in the stars that Quite I the that I have the polarity. Um, there is there's two answers, and the joyful, lustful answer would be I would spend the whole day cooking and making and eating aubergine. I have such an obsession with that, and I would feed yeah, you. We really all. need to understand this. I aubergine. would feed you with uh, baba ganoush mutabel and melanzana alla parmigiana with my daughter, definitely. Okay. 
Uh, but on the more serious note, if I had a day to do anything I wanted where there's magic involved in, in uh, replying I that like answer, having magic involved, so continue, please. Yes, then um, I would... Then somehow we would need to use that time... Uh, would you talk to someone special? Would you try to convince someone? Or just do yeah, I was I was on the convincing side. Like, how do we take? What do we do with the oil industry in a, uh, to force them to to stop extracting oil and gas from the ground? But then I was thinking, so a test of one day not doing that, what would that mean? Very little. So a day was too short. Mm. So I need to do something probably um, more effective with my time then. Um, and you could also say, I would like to use the, that day for an arena with an audience. Like you would go to the World Economic Forum or you would go to the uh, UN Assembly and you would say, but that's been done. The case has been stated so many times by so many people, not, not the least uh, the UN Secretary General, who's very harsh in his words. So that wouldn't contribute more than probably be fun to, 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 to see what happens when you address the... Uh, the world. The world. So that would be an ego thing, and we don't have time for that. That's bullshit. Oh, shit. Um, okay. I think we have to dwell on this. Yeah, but what yeah. I would like I'll go to. Right. Just yeah. eat aubergine. Yeah. It's follow <laughs> lust, belly, stomach. Uh, and, uh, All right, the aubergine. But I would give you, if I would uh, be able to, I would give you an arena to speak to the world. Because even if other people have spoken to it, it would be pretty interesting to uh, see what happened. But depressingly, I think very little. So I spend a lot of time thinking about what do you really do in order for people to change? And there's there's interesting groups that think about like climate psychology. What are the thing the factors that change mm. us? Is it carrot? Is it stick? Is it fear? Is it not? And we're going to talk about my book. Um, and don't tell anyone. But one of the reasons I've written the book uh, is because... Talking about climate change from a geopolitical military uh, perspective allows you to step out of the, the green hallelujah pioneering the possible and, and all the, the financial returns. Mm -hmm. And it also allows you to step out of the activist role, which can be sometimes intimidating. And you talk about it in real terms. What does the military think about it? How does the Pentagon analyze the world? And that allows you to switch perspectives. And I've seen a huge change in uh, people's understanding of climate change. Let's okay, dive fine. in. No, I will, but let's... I'll, I'll do that. I will go speak to the, the militaries. So allow them to have the arena. I will give my day to the generals. <laughs> With that said, I, we really need to dive into the book a little bit more. Uh, as you said, this book has been written. Uh, you are one of the co-authors. Can you tell me more about the book and the impact from the book that you want to well, have? The, the whole book, it's uh, written by the Swedish green think tank Fores is the publisher. And what they wanted to do, uh, which I adhere to, is look at uh, climate from a geopolitical perspective. Mm. Which means uh, if you look at it, if you uh, zoom out and look at the power play... How will climate impact that? And um, what I wanted to write in, in my chapter was looking at it from a, an adaptation point of view as well as a trans, uh, transition point of view because they're two quite different things. Mm. Um, and in, how, in what way do you think they're different? The, uh, the transition allows for much more possibilities, opportunities, excitement, innovation, new technologies. So there's a switch, to, pun intended, uh, in the transition, which um, potentially has a negative impact for those who are being switched, mm -hmm. and that's fine. And a huge opportunity for those who were switching to in the fossil-free economy. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at that from a geopolitical point of view, we haven't succeeded. I mean, the oldest trick in the book is having a common enemy. Mm. And we haven't succeeded <clears throat> over the last four decades to make climate the common enemy in the sense that we have to work together. But then allowing the, the more traditional power struggle between nations and companies and spheres of the world to, to compete, to win and own the next chapter of humanity much, seems to be a much more powerful driving force, which means... So, no, stop it. What did you mean here? If we as Team the US, Team Europe, Team Africa, Team China can see geopolitical uh, positive impact for us as a group when we uh, 
uh, invent new steel, when we create new platforms, when we lead the way uh, in terms of uh, renewable energies, if we become the new infrastructure. And you can see it now in Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Mm. You're already seeing a tension between the US and Europe in terms of uh, that the Americans are subsidizing and putting a lot of effort into uh, stimulating the economy, the green economy and the innovation. And the Europeans are going, what? This is hurting mm. us. Uh, and we're going to bicker about this for a while, but hopefully, and that's the, the, um, the, the comment I'm making in the book, this, the natural tendency we have to compete, which is a great uh, human trait, potentially will uh, create a race to the top. This reminds me of the race to the moon. A little bit? Of course. It, so, has, it has all that. The adventure of that, which uh, ignites many positive aspects of the human trait and the human makeup. So do you think that we are, are we getting, I mean, because the race to the moon triggered so much innovation and everything. And it was an impossible task from the beginning. But people, I mean, there, the race was US versus Russia and so on. Have we started to see this? Is this what you're saying? We've definitely started to see it, not in complete isolation. It is not as a clear cut example as the race to the moon, because that's a, a, um, a narrative in itself. But it ha definitely has uh, similarities and many of them are quite positive mm -hmm. because if we and we have a, a some sort of free market in the sense <clears throat> we are going towards a fossil free economy or we'll have civilizational collapse, which means that uh, if we succeed, who will own that chapter of humanity? Who will be the producers uh, and the financial gain, um, um, who will profit from owning everything that will build this next chapter of humanity? Will it be us? Will it be the Americans? Will it be the Chinese? Will it be a, uh, a mix of them? But that race in itself is positive. What do you project? Interesting question. Uh, and if you ask the activist or the the single mom in me, I don't fucking care. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So it's Thank like you. we need to survive awesome. in this. Yeah. But if you ask me as an investor, I mean, my portfolio is very interesting. So yeah. I'd love to look at that. Uh, or, of course, I'm a Swede, I'm a European, etc. But it, it's the forces here that I find fascinating. Um, and hopefully will be much more powerful than trying to get a, a global movement mm. because it's it's seemingly quite difficult because we delve back into things that are closer to heart my wallet right now my economy uh, social inequalities which are all real mm -hmm. and <clears throat> by pretending that they don't ex they don't exist uh, I think will hinder the whole process. But this is the transformation part of it. Mm. The other aspect is the, the, tra uh, the adaptation, which means, again, I like to call bullshit, bullshit on this whole success uh, that we're aiming for 1.5 degrees uh, global really? warming. Really? Okay, interesting. Elaborate. Well, it's, that is a disaster. 1.2 is a disaster. Anything above uh, zero is a disaster. And we've framed it in our minds as we're competing towards a finish line where we can tap ourselves uh, on the shoulders and say we succeeded. We only fucked up uh, to one and a half degrees. And we're already seeing now the consequences of it in terms of droughts, fires, migrations. So I think that in itself is, a, is an unsuccessful uh, and unhelpful way of looking at the challenge. Are you still hopeful that we will solve this? I, I, I think we caught you on the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, am I, still, uh, I don't want to use the word solve because we have, we have forever changed the planet's ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to be arrogant and say we can solve anything. Can we mitigate it? Um, can we create something where uh, that's livable? Yes, I, I really think we can. Mm. Um, but I think we need to uh, stop doing what we're doing right now. The way the, 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 the global international community is addressing it, I think, has strands of, of naive in it. And... Um, it, it is allowing a lot of people, we were talking about uh, taking the stage and pro proclaiming a vision or right or left. This type of challenge allows a lot of people to take the stage and proclaim and get the, the spotlight. Um, and that's also a bit problematic in it. So I think 
using the in- inherent human traits of competition and the adventure that comes with competition uh, and igniting innovation and with policy and regulation being very strict these are the planetary boundaries mm. our resources mm. are not uh, endless what is it that's stopping us with the geopolitics of today uh, and this is the beauty of it very little mm. um, because if you look at it from as a geopolitical competition uh nation states seem to be much swifter in changing behaviors policies and regulations in order to gain foot in the geopolitical game and all nations are doing some sort of i think we're over the worst of this phase but they're all competing to when they will be net zero that was the first part mm. we will be net zero by and then everyone had these different numbers and 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 they could compete on on that and then once that's done you then start need to implementing that what does that mean in each country and then finding ways for and and Sweden's reindustrialization in terms of our, our ambitions when it comes to steel for example mm-hmm. and green steel is a great example but also different types of energy sorts so i think the uh, here we have much more uh, um, room to maneuver but in the, in the whole international setting when everyone needs to be um, agreeing allows for a bureaucratic bickering that we don't have time for. And I think Al Gore said it quite well uh, in the World Economic Forum earlier this year. He was saying just the way that we are the rules of engagement in terms of voting rights in the COP we're just we're hamstringing ourselves and this is not a natural law we have decided how we're going to play the game mm. so we're pretending that we're stuck in some sort of bureaucratic uh, written in stone uh, setting let's decide something else let's decide that we're in a hurry yeah what could make us change that then oh uh, that's the that's a dangerous question and one answer could be the catastrophe that wakes us up hmm. is it my answer some days it is uh, but some days it's not my answer if you had the possibility to change three things in order to make a difference what would you do i would set an end date for when we take uh, when we extract coal and gas from the ground and i would decide we don't subsidize the oil and gas industry mm-hmm. and third thing i would eat a lot of aubergine <laughs> we have to go with the aubergine okay no but it, it it's it's quite clear that we we're setting it a uh, um a regulatory as well as a <clears throat> a political framework around a green transition mm. and we've signed the paris agreement and at the same time it is both lucrative and legal and now a race to extract quite a lot of oil and gas and out of the ground mm. ground before we hit some sort of end it it's completely illogical why are petro states and the oil and gas industry setting the rules of the game i i find it l- very irrational should they not be a part of the game and play do you want to exclude them completely or do you think ah uh, no again that's my angry me mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't work yeah um and i also think to be uh to be very pragmatic but also quite uh humble we've built our economy my life the the privileged pleasures that i enjoy is built on the oil and gas industry mm. and pretending that that's not true that is uh, naive and doesn't service anyone so mm. s- uh, some thinkers have uh suggested we thank the oil and gas industry so instead of creating a a, a competitive uh, or an angry aggressive conversation which i just did so i apologize uh, uh forcing them to defend themselves which is a natural consequence um we say thank you uh we have come this far because of you and we have chosen this it has been completely legal you've made gr- great money shake hands and then we buy their assets 
asking someone to just leave their assets is a is is a, a difficult uh, proposition mm. and it's not hard to understand i mean from a civilizational point of view it's completely um, ludicrous but it's also not hard to understand why you would want to defend your position so i think states should purchase these assets and say thank you very much and then Alas, it's over and yeah. you, you start anew. But if we, th if we think that we're going to uh, fight it and ask them to, uh, to leave, we, this is going to go on for another 30, 30 40 years. And we don't so have better that. to find collaborations and find exits together with them. Yeah. Then. And do an, uh, I know you're actually an investor in geothermal as well. Yes. And there is a collaboration, right, between oil and gas moving into geothermal. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the oil industry... Uh, drills into the ground and extracts oil and gas. And um, the potential of geothermal is also drilling into the ground. And there's a very natural uh, way of uh, catalyzing the DNA of the oil industry, which is drilling, yeah. uh, which they do really, really well. And they've got a lot of equipment for it. And we're doing a test out in, in Texas, Houston, with an oil rig company uh, to see if we can take the residual heat from the planet and use that as an infinite source of renewable energy. It's win-win-win. It's a win-win-win. I know that you're very invested in um, AI and technology. What what would be your comment on that? What's needed to be done in order to uh, excel? Well, there are a few things to say. One is from a, a pure transitional point of view, a lot of the technology that we need exists, especially to do the first 50% up to 2030. So it's, now it's a question not of innovation, but of scaling things that we have. Mm. And uh, the think tank team has produced a great report, which is called AI for Sustainability. It's free to download on our homepage, where we give quite a lot of examples of how uh, AI already today is serving humanity in terms of the transition. Mm. And it could be anything from understanding uh, leaks of heat and, and cold in buildings, uh, energy efficiency, understanding the grid production efficiencies, using AI uh, in terms of material de detection, but also uh, creating crops and uh, resistant um, the new types of foods, horizontal uh, farming, etc. Mm. So there's a lot of things going on. And I think it's easy to pretend, or there's a, there's a fun one-liner that if you're a politician, we're going to uh, invest in innovation. For me, I find that such an odd way of framing it because it puts all the responsibility on someone else. Where are these innovators that are going to innovate? And you say, please come up to the table and, and let's uh, innovate for the future. As a politician, what you need to do is create a framework, an infrastructure that allows the innovation to scale. Oh, Yay! That's just going to bullshit me. <laughs> no, that, I love that. Because we have. Yeah. So we need capital. We need them uh, to get their first clients. And their first clients might need to be the public sphere. So the public sphere, this is uh, scary stuff here, the public s sphere needs to take technical risk. And our legislation. The public sphere, how yeah. do you mean by that? Schools, hospitals, infrastructure, uh, the military is quite good at it actually, mm -hmm. um, needs to purchase technology early on in its development. And here we have a regulation and which is built for another era and for another type of challenge, which mm. is we need to be prudent with taxpayers' money. Mm. And I completely agree. We need to be prudent with taxpayers' money. However, everything now is technology. And if you as Sweden decide, no, we want to be prudent, so therefore we will only buy technology that is tested and robust. Which I think is bullshit. Sure. You will always be five, six, seven, ten years after the market, and the market decides what you will buy. Mm. You need to be in the. Uh, you're not Sweden. You need to be in the in the captain's seat, and you have to co-create technology with the, the private sphere. So therefore, we might need to change the rules of the game. And in that, I'm getting all worked up and I angry. Like it, yeah. But and this is why I need to uh, apologize for getting worked up and angry. We also need to be kind and humble. Because a transition is difficult. We know where we need to go, but we do not know the steps. That means you and I, as leaders, as politicians, as citizens, we need to uh, honestly say, we're now going to take step one, 
We're going to assess what happened and then we're going to decide on step two and we're going to assess and learn and decide on step three. But this doesn't work if you are a publicly listed company or if you're a public institution because we set budgets and plans and that's how we communicate. Mm. <clears throat> and that means we need to completely rethink how we operationally do this transition. And in that, we will make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we as consumers, as citizens, as journalists, need to be kind mm. and not go, you fucked up. Mm. I've used fucked three times today. I apologize. And I love it. <laughs> Can I do that? I'm really sorry. I'm exhausted. There was, uh, I was listening to you in a podcast and you had such a uh, clever way of saying it. You were saying that as a parent, you don't get a manual when you get your kid. But we are some kind of, we are somehow expecting that we should have a manual on how to do the sustainability and all of this. And we don't dare to do the same thing. What we need to actually look at it as we are parents. Yeah. So we're stuck with it. Yeah. We know that in 18 <laughs> years we want to have either happy or successful or whatever it is, yeah, kids. And um, genetics, friends, the weather, the food, everything is going to uh, alter the, the plan that we thought we had in our head. And we have to think on our uh, feet and every day adjust our plan towards our uh, happy uh, daughter in 18 years. I think that we'll have to conclude this part of the show. So, Aurora, it's time for the question from the future, Oof. where the kids uh, ask questions that we... I'm getting all goosebumpy. Yeah, we need to answer. Are you ready for your question from no, the future? No, but go. Questions from our future. How can we make everybody work together? I think the, uh, the honest answer is we can't. And uh, there's a lot of peace in understanding that we can't. But there's enough people uh, that we can work together with. And I think that's where we need to put our efforts in. Like, who are the front runners? Who, uh, who is excited about it? And I think to, to, uh, to, uh, to circle back where we started, I think instead of looking at everyone, what are the different groups that are adding different elements into this? Mm -hmm. And today the conversation is very hallelujah-esque. It's looking for profitability. The green transition is not a business opportunity. There are lots of business opportunities in the green transition, but that's not the same thing. And there's going to be huge wealth created in this transition, but the whole needs to be seen for what it is. And I think uh, in terms of the question, how do we get people to collaborate, is both uh, the investor community, uh, the innovation community, the technology community, Politicians setting a very clear framework, which is we will not violate our planetary boundaries. We will set a price on carbon and then mm. add, which I talk a lot about in the book, our military and defense community. The military and defense community will add something to the conversation that doesn't really exist enough, in my opinion, today, which is the cost element of the adaptation. The military is not looking to be re-elected and they're not looking at the ROI, which, is, which means that when you start uh, analyzing, which I've done for the research for the book, if you start analyzing how the Pentagon sees the world, they call climate a conflict multiplier. You have political tensions around the world, as you do. Mm. You add climate, you add fire, you add drought, you add melting of glaciers. It is a conflict multiplier, an escalation of existing political tension. And the Arab Spring is an, is an early good example of that, where the fires in Russia the summer before, the, uh, the droughts in China and the Chinese government purchasing wheat, making the wheat price um, escalate uh, over 30%, which then had uh, very dire implications for, for North Africa. Interesting how you... Which means that uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring, nothing in that conversation was new, but what ignited it? You could say 
the wheat price ignited it and food and the reality on the ground. And if you look at a future where you have multiple conflicts around the world, uh, exaggerated <laughs> by uh, climate impact, you will look at a completely different world from a military point of view. And if you look at where our biggest uh, glaciers are, for example, in the Himalayas, who are melting uh, in countries that have nuclear weapons, what does that mean when a failed state uh, happens and multiple failed states around the world? Wh who, who are you going to call? Mm. And so what the, uh, the American... The uh, only thing I had to think about was Ghostbusters. <laughs> Sorry, but, <laughs> no, but, but I don't know who to call, actually. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Swedish military and defense and, and uh, defense organizations around the world are now starting to look at a, a completely different world. So if you look at the other side of how climate is changing the geopolitical game is that the maps are being re rewritten. Cities potentially need to move. We have billions of people that need to migrate uh, from uninhabitable parts of the world. Mm. And we potentially have failed states that have nuclear arms which means we have conflict on the rise. And the other element is potentially we could find ourselves in a situation where we need to defend tipping points and carbon sinks. Let's uh, pose the, the question. The Amazon is the lungs of the world. Mm. Are the Brazilians, and previously Bolsonaro, uh, are the Brazilians in charge of the Amazons and the lungs of the world? Or are they global custodians of something that we all need? And what if the Amazons are dying? Do we have a right uh, in a, some sort of eco-war to defend that or the carbon sinks in Russia? And I think potentially we will see conflicts of a completely different nature. Again, a different side, the adaptation side of a new climate and a new world that will have geopolitical implications. And I think if we look at it from this point of view, it's purely cost. Mm -hmm. It's death, conflict, cost, despair. But uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a strategist and if you look at it, there's opportunity to geopolitically um, to, to play the game. But this allows us for, for us to uh, look at it the, the budget slightly differently. So how do we co collaborate? We get different voices in looking at it uh, from different angles and not only the green hallelujah, the transition is profitable. So that's how we should collaborate then? Yeah. So, Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, but I, but I like it because you explained a little bit how about the, how the whole concept works. But if you then would summarize this to uh, a child, what would you say? How, would you, how, how should we make them collaborate better? I would say not everyone. So let's let, let's not pretend that everyone should be there, but we should have um, the the transitional uh, and the opportunity side of uh, the table, the voice, as well as the cost and the adaptation and the military uh, and the policymakers that set the framework. So it's a smorgasbord of different opinions. That is very much needed in order to solve this. So thank you very much for answering that question. <laughs> Let's move into an uncomfortable conversation. Uncomfortable conversations. Uh, you said that in order to be in the business boards and meeting, you can be proclaimed as an alarmist. So you need to be more of a ge geopolitical strategist. Wouldn't a little realistic fear of the potential future and climate collapse push a change a little faster or do we just need to talk numbers and businesses? I don't find that uncomfortable at all, to be honest, uh, because I think it's just uh, it's the the reality of where we are. And I think uh, we need to create a, a, a slight sense of urgency amongst um, business boards, potentially in management in terms mm. of what is happening right now. So we've moved away from why we're going to do this. We've understood the green transition. We've signed the Paris Agreement. We're slowly putting together uh, a framework and we're now in the phase of finding the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying, now it's all about the transition being a huge business opportunity and um, doing well is doing good, etc. And there's very little nuance in that. And potentially that's necessar a necessary step in the process, which is getting people excited about the innovation and, uh, and what it means for their businesses. 
What I find problematic here is, is that I think we're doing ourselves a bit of a disservice by uh, telling the market and our consumers and our citizens that it's only going to be opportunities uh, mm -hmm. and, and profit <clears throat> at the end of it. And as I was saying, we, we can't pick the lucrative cherries out of the cake and we will quite soon be faced with a reality that's, that is expensive. And it tends to be on the adaptation side, the cost, the risk, the physical assets that will be uh, stranded, maps rewritten, etc. Um, and one of the tools that I think fits this phase of hallelujah mm -hmm. uh, is uh, setting a price on carbon. And I've written a report on that, which is also free to download on sysdecable.com, about how you as a management team and as a board, and what I'm saying there, as the, uh, a member of a board of a company, you are borderline negligent if you don't understand the real cost of your business. Which means if you're going to go into a new market, if you're going to start a new product, you're going to do uh, an M&A, you're moving into a strategic uh, whatever, if you don't understand the carbon cost of that decision, you are in no position to move, which means you don't understand the, the real cost of your, uh, of your product. But do you actually think that people do understand? I would actually counter, I would say that like nine out of 10 don't understand. They haven't even started asking they this question. They haven't even started and they don't even know that they should ask it properly. And we're seeing now uh, some pioneers here that have decided we will have an internal price on carbon. Mm -hmm. The price on carbon is coming. We will not be able to em emit uh, greenhouse gases and mother earth pays forever. Um, and legislation is, is here in several markets and Sweden's quite doing quite well, but it will move forward quite fast, which means if you are producing anything and you don't understand A, how much you're emitting, you don't even measure how much you're emitting properly, um, and you haven't played around with where we're discussing a carbon price should be and internally uh, made the exercise, how does that impact my margin and my profit? Mm. So you could, at the end of that exercise, go, okay, my margin has decreased with this, my profit has decreased with it, but you know what? My product is still profitable. Mm. Or you come to the conclusion it's not, which is a much more interesting thing. But have that in the board, which means that at some point you need to move some levers in order for your product to be profitable in a very near future, otherwise you're not responsible. Do you think we can do this with the generation sitting on the power today or should we just like remove them and uh, exchange them for new people? I love that, let's remove them. <laughs> um, I, I think the, the language is quite clear because if you understand that you are in charge of something that potentially won't exist and you don't even know, you haven't made the internal exercise of understanding your real margin, I think that tickles most people's competitive uh, streak going, I'm going to know my real pro uh, profit and margin, which means I think a lot of companies are slowly starting and, and several of my clients, I know they're coming and asking, mm -hmm. how do we do this? Um, doing at least the, the internal exercise. And I, there's some great companies of uh, Volvo uh, Cars has a, an internal price, uh, Société Générale, Shell, um, H&M apparently do as well for certain uh, aspects of their business, mm -hmm. but they haven't gone out and talked about what price they've set. There's, it's an open debate. Should, we, should it be $100 uh, per ton? Should it be 50? Should it be 15? You're not obliged yet. Mm. Play around with the numbers. If it, where, where will you be, alive or not, uh, when it hits? So then the uncomfortable conversation is actually who should then pay for it? Is it the companies? Is it the governments? Or is it us as citizens? Well, traditionally, we can see that it will be a mix of those. So if a, a, a company realizes my product is no longer profitable, my margins don't stack up, now that I know the real price of my product and I understand my emissions, the price of the product will increase. So effectively, it will be a price the company pays themselves. It will be a price on, uh, on the product. And here again, this is the uncomfortable conversation. This will change what we can buy and how the world looks. And that is the nature of a transition. Mm. It will not be the same. And here I find many politicians pretending that we will be able to live the exact same life just by innovation. 
And I'm sure we'll find a great life. It doesn't have to be a doomsday thing. But pretending that it won't be a transition and we don't need to exchange things from our daily routine is making a, is doing everyone a disservice. And I don't think you'll be re-elected a gazillion times if you continue to peddle that. Yeah. I, I, another thing that I heard uh, doing the research for you, which I really loved, is uh, you took an example where the where well, we changed the law in Sweden to be able to uh, hit our children. Yeah. And before that legislation went through, it was a huge debate and everybody was saying, don't tell me how to raise my children. Can you elaborate on that? Because I, a, I think that's a... It was a huge faff. The state shouldn't uh, meddle in my parenting. Um, and the state did. And we decided we will not hit our children. And... It died down immediately. We stopped hitting our children, thank God. Um, and, and we had the same faff before um, legislating of smoking in public places. So I think we should also accept that there is a certain uh, unsettling before we create a, a new uh, legislation. And if you have politicians that are worried about that faffing part, which means oh, my constituents are now worried because I'm going to change their uh, immediate day to day. Then they should not be politicians. Then they shouldn't be politicians. <laughs> Thank you. If you're visionary, you will know this is what will be the best thing for uh, me, my country, our planet. And you will do it anyway. And ex the, all the examples show you will be reelected for that. Did you or hear not? that, Mr. Politician or Mrs. Politician out there? You will be reelected for that. <gasps> or not and go to bed. Like, do the right thing. Yeah, I think that's a, a good thing to think about as well. A, to a do question the from, the, from the side here. Is there a problem with politicians only being in charge for like four years? Is that something we need to change to have a, like a climate politician? And so he questions and... democracy yeah. very casually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I do actually, be because we talked a lot about with guests uh, in other episodes about should there be some global like de decision makers uh, b to do the decisions for the climate. Is there a problem with only be elected for four years and then you don't have to take responsibility for your actions? I mean, clearly the answer is yes, there is there is problemat uh, problematic elements in that. I'd say the other is even more problematic. I'd yeah. say the, uh, the the solutions that where you have where the people aren't involved are more problematic. Um, you asked previously what will make us take these decisions, uh, and I said that one answer is some sort of the real catastrophe. And the question is, when we finally get our act together, h how much damage have we created to the to the ecosystem? And if you ask me on a bad day when I can't get out of bed, what I'm worried about, for me personally, what happens if the Gulf Stream leaves us? If you take a, a map and look at Sweden, we're supposed to be subarctic. And without the Gulf Stream, this country doesn't exist in any way that we know it. So from a politician's point of view, talking about the next four year period, or I want to, everything to be the same. I don't want this transition. I don't want this transition, but we are in this uh, situation and not looking at it from a realistic point of view where we could be uh, and accepting that we will have uh, zero food production, our energy situation will be completely different. This will be more or less uninhabitable as we know it. Mm. Like the entitlement of talking about my little stuff that I want is outrageous. Do you feel that there are people that you think are role models in this that we need to learn from and do more of in order to succeed? Is there any good politicians out there that are really thinking? Yeah, but like, okay, I have two answers here. One is um, the Secretary General of the UN, of the, of the UN uh, Antonio Guterres. He talks about nothing but this, and he's very harsh in his critique towards the oil and gas industry. But like, does it matter? Does anything mm. actually move? And I apologize for sounding disrespectful for his for the office that uh, and the, his position. But it's it's like 
he's an actor in a game and that's his role to play to say that thing but i can't see um so where is the inspiration the guardian was uh, mapped out let's see if i say the, uh, the the numbers correctly but i think it's six percent of the population are indigenous and they are the custodians of 80 percent of our biosphere like the way they take care of our planet and lead our lives instead of this crap and I'm me included, uh, mm. that is inspirational. And we will potentially find ourselves in a situation where I'm going doomsday now. <laughs> you want it to be positive. <laughs> uh, we will find ourselves in a situation where our financial system, our infrastructure, our heating, our, uh, it uh, collapses. And in that scenario, who knows how to live? Our indigenous populations around the world uh, who know how to uh, treat the soil of the earth, take care of our animals, and we might see a complete uh, power reverse mm. uh, on the planet. But before that collapse, and I'm going to go back to your positive note, uh, I still think that there's um, something to be said about giving uh, the indigenous population a, a seat at the table. And I will go back to the, 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 the child's question. That is also a very important seat at the table in terms of collaborating. How does our planet work? And, and a, a true understanding of that from uh, the indigenous populations around the world um, and, um, and look at, at, at saving many of the biospheres because the, the biosphere collapse is potentially much more detrimental than the, uh, the carbon emissions and the climate that we're discussing. Mm. So in the end, collaboration, letting people sit at the table. Yeah, and the Thank right you. people. Great. We are coming to an end, Aurora. And uh, in the end here, we usually ask uh, our guests to send a sunshine to anyone out there who you want to elevate or who you want to say, uh, look into or listen more to. Who would you send your sunshine to? So I was very disrespectful to the UN secretary two seconds ago, and I would like to reverse that because there are key players that have a role to play and they are v uh, taking in a very uncomfortable position and being... They must feel very monotonous and lonely in this, uh, in this rhetoric. He being one of them, Al Gore being one of them, Greta being a another of them, uh, the Aurora group in Sweden, uh, the group of uh, kids that are suing the Swedish state. There is the equivalent in the US. There are so many people that uh, continue to march on, even though it's uncomfortable, lonely, and um, chapeau, and I salute them. <laughs> What's your key <laughs> summary of today's conversation? I need these at home. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We can. We won't give them to you, but we can make sure that uh, that we tell you where. Me and my daughter can <laughs> uh, up each other in bullshit. Uh, no, my uh, and key, also. Of course, of course. Uh, my key, key takeaways is that we need to continue the conversation. Uh, the, uh, the repetitive nature of talking about the same thing has, serves a purpose. And um, I hope that mm, more people allow this to be profitable and fun and an adventure. And at the same time, hold on to the fact that this is not a game. It is for real. And allowing uh, that voice uh, to participate in that so we don't only do uh, the, the profitable parts of this transition. To add to that, I would say I really like your way of saying that we need to do this iteratively. We don't have an manual, but sometimes we also need to rewrite the rules. Oh, yes. And I yes. really think that that is something to bring with us. And if you're not ready to rewrite the rules, you should not be in a mandate position. Here, because here. We should be able to do this together. You are an amazing person, a very inspirational person, and you have a lot of knowledge. All the sunshine from me to you. Thank you. Continue, that was sweet. Continue the awesome. quest, and uh, we look forward having you back on the show because we have <laughs> tons of more questions to ask you for the future. But for now, it's time to end today's conversation. So thank you for joining us here at The Switch, and thank you for listening. And remind you share because the most and biggest impact is when we give something from one to another 
and to be a part of this switch. So I hope that you send this off to someone you uh, care about and that in between I see you now and the next time you take care of yourself and hopefully someone else. See you. Take care. Oh, 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 oh